Hey, everyone. I want to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Copper. Copper is an institutional custodian in crypto and provider of prime services. They're also one of my favorite companies in the space. So thank you very much to Copper for making this episode possible. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the show. What's up, everyone? This episode is brought to you by Mantra Chain, the security first compliance focused L1, which is onboarding the next wave of financial institutions. You're going to be hearing all about them later in the program. But for now, Mantra, thanks for making the show possible. All right, everyone, welcome back to another weekly roundup edition of On The Margin. Uh, I am joined, as always, by my co-hosts, Quinn Thompson and Tyler Neville. Fellas, welcome. Mike, I got a question. Happy Friday to Captain America. <laughs> Come on. How many uh, people Tyler. you have last night? Looks like you, uh, you had like 15. I, <laughs> <laughs> thanks for making me feel self-conscious. I literally, I pulled this, I pulled this up and I was like, oh, buddy. <laughs> like you got to get some sunlight. <laughs> Look at my own face. Um, <laughs> conference. That, it was like the it was like the the picture of Zuck on this week with with that jacket and the sunglasses at McDonald's. It looked like he deleted about fifty beers the night before. I, you, you need that that outfit, dude. The Zuck comeback arc that is a sight to behold. I it, just a couple years ago he was the most hated tech executive, and now I feel like he did that video where he was slamming the Apple. Vision Pro, he's like posting videos of him making a freaking katana out in Japan, and everyone's like, "Let's go, Zach!" Come, come on, you know what he's doing? He's just seeing the waves of the, now. It's cool. MMA is cool, and he's doing jujitsu. I, 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 I'm selling the news on that one. That yeah, you might be right. You know what? Really, I really think what this just is is this is the Elon effect, where the best thing that ever happened to Zach is <laughs> Elon becoming slightly less likable to the general population a while ago but all right let me let me let me give you guys a because you're i am i'm on the ground here at eat denver and i've been here for a couple days now it's um yeah i'm still feeling the effects of this this after party from last night but i'm gonna try to chug through this so basically it's it's very good vibes this is kind of the goldilocks period of time for for folks who haven't spent a lot of time going to crypto conferences they're very pronounced bear and bull market conferences and the bear market conferences are like no one's really there except for the true believers. You know, you've got nerds on stage trying to convince people that ZK Tech is the future. And it's actually very high signal. And basically, the more important thing is, are there more developers or are there more investors? And if there are more developers, you basically buy <laughs> and invest at that time. If there are more investors, you sell. This is, kind of a, this is kind of a midway point where I think folks have accepted that the bull market is back. Uh, you know, spirits are high, but it's nothing crazy yet. And... I think there are two areas of, of clearly pronounced interest, at least from my perspective. One is restaking, which is not really a big surprise. Eigenlayer has attracted an enormous amount of deposits, um, and it's theoretically launching pretty soon. But the other, the other area, and I talked to you guys about this on our pre-call, is AI. This AI crypto intersection. There is so... I know, Tyler, you're laughing, dude. There is <laughs> there's so much energy around that. And... Who do, I think I think everyone's trying to build things that probably aren't going to be useful for five years or so. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of hot money thrown at it this cycle, but I think my my conviction is that this is shaping up to be the hypey thing for this cycle. It's like everything else and then AI and crypto. So that's my takeaway from... <laughs> I know you're just I'm waiting to say something. Like I'm selling that. I mean, not, not, I'm not saying that there's not going to be like an AI token bubble or, or any of that stuff. All I'm saying is it, you get in these cycles, you get fake sociopaths looking for capital and they get the, the tagline AI and tokenizing AI. Like Google can't even figure out with like a trillion dollar balance sheet how to like deliver Gemini. You know, they just like completely flubbed that whole release. And you expect AI tokens on the blockchain? Come on. I mean... I get the vision, but there's not that many people that can do AI that good anyway, let alone AI and crypto together. Like, come on. Bye. Bye. Also, here's my thing about <laughs> altcoins in general. Bye. Yeah, but altcoins, none of these guys can tell me what they're doing. Like, I, I've been around this for five years. And, like, I'm doing this crazy protocol that blah, 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 blah gobbledygook. Like, at least translate to me what the hell this thing does you know like i get some of them some of them are good but uh, but are the they, people that are buying smci at a thousand and sending it to 1500 next month and, and nvidia to you know a grant like 
come on. Like, no one knows what the, what they're buying at the end of the day, right? Well, they at least have a product that users use where it's like, you know, AI tokens. Like, how many people are using these protocols? They can't even give you a straight answer. Well, they haven't even, none of these things have even launched yet. There, and there, are, there is a coach in And by the way, both of these things can be true. It can be extremely useful in the long term, but really overhyped in the short term. There's a pretty neat way that I feel like this is where I've gotten into trouble in my own uh, thoughts around crypto before is you look at something, it's clearly hypey, you write it off, but then it just takes a little bit longer than you think and then it becomes super real. And the people that get in early are going to do super well and just be believers the entire way. Just, just to get a little bit con- more concrete about the use cases, because you brought up Gemini, there is a use case for crypto in open sourcing and making these models more neutral. Like you actually just said it yourself with all the whole balance sheet, and all of the data, the data, the proprietary data sets that Google had, they still came out with Gemini and were still a massive flop, right? So I think there's a pretty strong case actually to making the governance and ownership of these models more neutral. There's another one in, in crypto, which is pretty interesting, which is these, uh, these agents. So just like in TradFi, how mostly you interface now with market makers, they're internalizing a lot of the flow and actually executing that on your behalf. That same trend is happening in crypto. You used to, interface directly with a protocol. Now a market maker is going to stand in between you and the protocol and do all this complicated stuff that you don't want to do. So you could either interface directly with like a winter mute or an SCP, which are kind of two of the, the 800 pound gorillas in the room, or you could just do with this AI agent who would theoretically be 80% or 90% as good and extremely cheap. So that's kind of, that's, those are like the two categories of things that people are building. And hence why I said that's going to take many, many years to build out, right? That's very complicated stuff. but. Yeah, there's a lot of fast money that wants to. It's like fading, uh, fading NFTs last cycle, though. I mean, you just can't do it. Yeah. And if if the Nasdaq's going up, stuff, you know, semiconductors, at Nvidia, SMCI is going up. You got to be long. You got to be long render. You got to be long all the tokens. Hey, everyone. Wanted to give a quick shout out to this episode's sponsor, Copper. Copper is an institutional custodian and provider of prime services within digital assets. Today, what I want to talk to you specifically about is Clearloop. Clearloop is a solution from Copper, which to me solves one of the biggest problems for market makers, high frequency traders, hedge funds within digital assets. You know the exquisite pain of what I call the pre-funding problem. So if you want to take advantage of arbitrages that pop up across different exchanges, or you just have a trading strategy, which requires you to be active on multiple different centralized exchanges, you have to pre-fund your account at each one of those exchanges. Now, this is not ideal for a whole bunch of reasons. One, you have to take counterparty risk from those exchanges, which as we saw this last year can have major consequences. Two, it's capital inefficient. You have a whole bunch of assets spread out that are most of them are not doing anything most of the time. And three, it's just not great from a workflow standpoint and it creates administrative overhead. So enter Clearloop. Clearloop is the secure MPC custody solution provided by Copper. The way that it works is you deposit your assets into this MPC solution, which is owned and, owned and operated by you. Clearloop syncs up with a whole bunch of your favorite exchanges, and then you can trade securely from Clearloop itself while not taking any counterparty exchange risk with any of these exchanges. And it's a super easy and nice UX. Now, Clearloop is trusted by the likes of Flow Traders, Brevin Howard, Nickel, some of the best in the business. But the coup de gras is in the extreme edge case that one of these exchanges were to go bankrupt, they have a very clever trust structure which segregates your assets and keeps you completely protected. So click the link at the bottom of this episode, especially if you're a hedge fund or market maker and you want to learn more or better yet, Dimitri, the CEO, is actually going to be in person on a panel hosted by yours truly at Digital Asset Summit. So Das London, that's March 18th to 20th in London. So you should definitely click the link at the bottom of this episode, give your boy some credit, but also even better, come to Das London and hear from Dimitri himself. All right, cheers everyone. Sure. Well, all right, let's, uh, yeah, I want to walk through, there was a really great thread, shout out to Alex Thorne over at Galaxy who put out this great long form piece on X talking about Bitcoin this week and he covered a whole bunch of different angles. And I want to get, I want to get a couple of different um, questions uh, answered from you guys, which is one, this is something that a lot of people are asking, at least at ETH Denver this week, which is where are we in the cycle and trying to put some data points around previous cycles um, that we can sort of measure, measure up against. And then I think what we're even starting to get into early in this conversation is, is this going to be a Bitcoin only cycle where this institutional capital is flowing into Bitcoin ETFs and it doesn't translate or spill over into other 
crypto assets like it has in previous cycles? Or is it going to be the exact same as pre uh, previous cycles and altcoins and Ethereum and uh, crypto equities are going to do just as well? Um, so I guess one of the one of the statistics that Alex put together is we're we're sort of it feels like we're maybe front running um, in terms of price action where we've been in previous cycles. So we've got our alt or uh, the having coming up in uh, like 54 days, uh, something like that. And usually at this point, Bitcoin is anywhere from 40 to 55 percent off its all time high. Today, we're sitting at 7% uh, off its all-time high. And I think the bear market has been slightly shorter than it's been in the past. Um, and so there's kind of a debate about, are we front-running this cycle? You know, Did we go through enough pain during this last bear market to pave the way for the bull? Um, how do you guys think about just where we are in this cycle and how much is it going to measure up to previous crypto cycles? Maybe, Quinn, I can toss that over to you first. Yeah, I thought uh, Thorns, I love Alex. Is, he's everybody's Bitcoin spirit animal. I love it. Uh, I he watch is. all his raps. Um, and, and then he tweeted this and then I, I went, when I saw it, the price was like nuking for that like 10% candle then right back. Uh, no, but I thought the thread was really good. I, I think where we're at, I don't think it gets enough discussion that really maybe April, like 2021 was, was more closer to what the peak could have been for last cycle rather than the fall. Um, you know, price obviously peaked in the fall, but there's a lot of dynamics, uh, underneath the hood that, that made it look like it, it could have been the April peak. So that might have thrown some of the like cycle timing things off. Uh, but, but if you just step back logically, you know, think about the amount of people onboarding into crypto. If you bought your first coins in 2017 at the peak and, and you came back full cycle in 2020, and then now you're here, um, that reaction function gets, has to get shorter and shorter every cycle, right? Like how many times do you have to see something 10 X in a year after falling 80% to know you should probably try and front run that. So naturally these cycles are are kind of should get shorter should get uh less extreme to the upside just a ball dampening and that that reaction function should be quicker um the etf threw probably the biggest wrench again on top of that with unleashing this new new avenue of capital flowing in relentlessly and and you know we'll talk about as well like the rotation to alts but that that's really confused a lot of people as to if that rotation's ever coming. And uh, to me, it's kind of like we're probably December 2020-ish, or no, by no means early anymore. I mean, you know, it's important to work. We're 4X off the lows on, on corn. Uh, tough to say we're still early, but uh, we haven't seen any parabolas and we know we know that's coming at some point. So I think, I think we're in a good spot. Uh, if you're not, I think you should be packing your spot bags here if they're not already. And, and we're getting close to that all-time high area where or you probably shouldn't be adding a ton of like. I I think you know, I think Bitcoin is going to be a a global sovereign reserve asset here. So, uh, and not to get too bullish, obviously things can change if they adjust the price of fiat currency. But we're kind of looking at a global you know, easing cycle until twenty twenty five. If you're going off Mike Howell stuff. So liquidity could be going up globally in, in fiat tickets. And so uh, relatively, why would you own, like one of the things I keep asking myself is, who is going to own treasuries in the next 10 years? If you have you know, commercial real estate unwinding and the petrodollar uh, recycling, are they going to buy treasuries? Are, uh, who in our generation is saying, oh, you know what? The treasury bond's a great deal. You know, there's a tectonic shift going on here uh, of reserve asset value, and it's starting. You know, Bukele and, and Sailor and you know Malay. There's there's shifts happening, psychological shifts happening here, where this could be way bigger than we think it is. And you know, just just Bezos was rumored to put you know a billion dollars in this past couple of days. I don't know if it's true. But the fact that billionaires, if this keeps going up and they need a store of value for their billions, this is going to create kind of like um, magnet effects for everybody else that has lots of capital. 
Like, look at the, I don't know if the Vanguard guy got ousted because they didn't buy Bitcoin, but these are all things where it's now becoming a risk not to own it. And so that's kind of a fascinating psychological thing. Before, you know, people would rag on you if you, you know, you were a Bitcoin guy in the last cycle. Now it's like, um, I should probably have like a couple percent just in case, right? That, that psychological shift is happening. And now do it for endowments. Now do it for corporates. Now do it for sovereigns. Like that, that is a trillions of dollars, right? And then just, just the basic rotation from gold. This is demographic rotation, but like Mark and I talk about this all the time at Corriente. But remember when our parents were gifted China, like the plates and stuff? Yeah. So that stuff is now worthless. And so there's lots of things. Don't tell that to my mom. Right? <laughs> He's been keeping her. I don't think we've ever used it. She gifted Mike that sweater 10 years ago. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, where did that come from? Oh, Oh, God. I've been getting compliments on the sweater, actually. And I need to wear it because my Airbnb that I'm staying in right now has no heat. I'm in Denver. It's February. I've got no heat in this Airbnb. Year for Blockworks, dude. God, nuts. This guy buried the lead. I, I don't want to detract too much here, but I literally, I get in and it's like 60 degrees in Denver during the day. So I get in, Airbnb looks nice. At night I come back and it's like 45 degrees in the Airbnb. I'm like, what is going on here? Looking for the heat, looking for the heat. Finally, I look at the text that this guy sent me the day before. It's like, hey, uh, here's, how you, here's where the lockbox is. Here's the Wi-Fi password. Oh, and there's no heat. Like, are you kidding me? Like, I buried the lead. You yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. If this God, goes middle man. winter, this guy's yeah. going to look like the worst Airbnb host <laughs> just post the link in the show notes <laughs> yeah wait tyler can i actually can i poke at this though because this is about to be the third time in at least the time that i've been working in crypto where crypto has been cool so i get that there's this kind of feeling of tectonic shift where bitcoin used to be kind of a cringe thing and now it's cool but this has happened to me this is about to be the third time where it's been cool and i've felt it be cool and then it's not going to be cool again and I actually, I was maybe like a, a, a counterpoint to what you're describing here about uh, maybe sovereigns like the El Salvador's of the world accepting Bitcoin. One thing that we saw last cycle is that actually the more successful crypto and Bitcoin ultimately get, the more you're going to get pushback from countries and sovereigns as incumbents who this is directly against their financial interests. Um, and I was listening to another podcast in the Blockworks Podcast Network, 1000X, um, Avi Fellman, kind of... Uh, you know, his theory actually was the next bear market is going to be caused by uh, sovereigns outlawing crypto outright. Uh, and I think this is already starting to happen in Nigeria, where you know, their currency is inflating like hell, and they're trying to make crypto illegal to hold outright. And I, I don't think that this is the that this is the last this SEC crackdown in the US is the last attempt from sovereigns who are inflating their currencies to fight crypto. So I think what would you say about that? I'd say the, the greater battle here is a battle against autocracy versus you know democratic capitalism. Yeah. Where if you're going to be an autocratic government and kind of milk your uh, citizens, you, you probably don't like Bitcoin. And so, but what what's happening? I think is the more countries plug into this, the more corporates plug into this. It's similar to like. U.S. cannabis, right? Which is one of our themes too. But cannabis, when you, when a state takes cannabis legal, it puts the state right next to them at a tax disadvantage because, like, they now have a revenue stream that you know New Jersey has it, and then Pennsylvania feels like it has to have it because their mm-hmm. citizens are going to buy legally, right? And this is sort of the same principle where it, you're you're creating a lower cost of capital for your country if you own bitcoin look at look at the bonds in el salvador they're probably you know trading i don't even know where they're trading but it way way better than they were when bitcoin was half as much and so that psychology is like oh my god look at sailors balance sheets gonna look way better once the fasb rules go through so like there's this thing that's happening where it's it's a global competition it's a geopolitical competition that will create more and more demand as, as it goes up. Now, you know, they could, you know, there's political risk where that could change or, you know, interest rates could go up. The Fed could tighten a little bit. 
And, and that's probably your bigger risk right here right now where that takes some leverage out of it. But the longer term, I think this is the cycle where it's like, oh, the internet's not like in 1998 or the 90s when the internet was created. It's like some people knew what it was. That second cycle, you know, more people knew. And then all of a sudden, like you had the internet browser and it's like, oh my God, right? And now you have the Bitcoin ETF. And I think it's like, oh my, it's, this is the moment where you're like, oh my God. Like mm. everyone can own this and custody is like not an issue. You don't have to worry about, you know, last cycle, my mother-in-law was like, okay, so I go on Coinbase and I, you know, the, what, what's going on here? She had no idea. But like, if you can go to the brokerage account and just say, hey, I want, you know, hundred shares of, you know, whatever Bitcoin ETF, that's easy. So I think it's a tectonic shift. Could be bumps along the way, obviously. Uh, there's going to be people that over lever themselves. I just think the leverage last time was primarily like this. It was kind of Ponzi finance where like you were showing your balance sheet and showing these assets and borrowing money from another counterparty internally. And now like if you look at the trading volumes alone, this is, this is going back to my Franklin Templeton days. When you trade for an institution that has billions of dollars, you have to be like, you have 10 million shares to buy of something. You have to be like three to 5% of the daily trading volume. Otherwise, the stock just rips your face off. Now, the tri you can see the trends as the money comes in. It's like you're slowly, slowly buying, slowly buying dips. And it's way different than the Sam Bankman Freed. Like you wake up in the morning and it's, you know, $10,000 higher. So this is, this is very healthy action, in my opinion. I agree. It's driving people nuts in crypto who are used to like 10x leverage and seeing the crazy volatility. That's this whole thing about the vault dampening is like, like BlackRock and all these people. No one, I mean, they're TWAP in huge numbers. That's, I mean, 500 million a day is huge, but like mm -hmm. they, that's, they're maxing out. Like you can't, you, you can't physically buy, like you said, Ty, without the price doing that. And I think that's, that's the interesting thing here is like we're like a month and a half into this ETF and th these flows have blown every estimate out of the water. Yeah. Um, we could fall 80% from here in daily flows average and it will still offset all new posts having Bitcoin. So like I agree that I think there's still complacency. I look around in crypto natives and, and yes, you can say funding is high. Um, and, and some of these other signs, the Coinbase app is rising in popularity. But I actually think there's still complacency around how meaningful this, this ETF is because none of the, like these arguments that are saying like, Oh, the, the ETF flows are bad because they're traders and not long term investors is just laugh, laugh out loud funny to me. Like that's saying the, that inflows to a stock is bad for its price because at some point investors might want to sell it and take profits. Like, these numbers are just way too big to even entertain those views. Mm. Well, I, I know you you're you've got a budding rivalry with Jim Bianco, Eric Quinn. I love we're, we're stuff. I just I, I just do thought too. I have the debate with him. We're well, we've got him coming on the podcast actually on Monday um, with him and Eric Balkunas. So they've been going back and forth on on Twitter about this. But maybe to to return a little bit to um, Alex's thread, he has some good indicators about there. There's some things that you can take a look at. Uh, in terms of where we where we sort of are in the cycle. And one of the important dynamics here, I think, because I, I agree with you guys, like we've been talking about on the show for a while now that these ETFs are fall dampening. There already is this existing trend in crypto where, you know, the peak to trough um, gains each cycle is less and less. There's like a law of large numbers effect here. There's a new set of investors effect. There's a better product effect in the terms of the ETF. So I agree structurally and directionally with everything that you guys are saying. But I do, I do still think there are some things that uh, basically the, the dynamic that is important to point out here is that Bitcoin does go up so fast that eventually people are going to want to take profits and that's going to lead to selling. And for all of our talk about there's going to be less volatility, I'll just mention that Bitcoin, Bitcoin put in its largest monthly candle ever in February in terms of nominal value, right? So there, that eventually will cause people to sell. And uh, Alex does a really good job of pointing out some of these, like we're still in a very healthy place. And I think Quinn, that that rhymes with what you said about still seeing complacency. So if you're following along via video, you're looking at a chart of the percentage of Bitcoin held by 
long-term versus short-term holders. And basically it's good um, that you still have like long-term holders sort of represent the strong hands uh, in this market. And short-term holders, um, is when, when there's a higher percentage of short-term holders, that's when you want to get a little bit nervous and those people are more likely to sell. There's another really interesting, um, there's another really interesting metric that I think this is calculated by uh, coin, coin metrics, um, which is MVRV, which is uh, market value to realize value. And you can think about this as trying to measure the aggregate cost basis of Bitcoin supply. So basically, if, uh, for example, if you bought a coin for $100 in 2012, and it hasn't moved since on chain, then that $100 uh, is what is contributed to this MVRV sort of score. And um, you can see when MVRV is low, um, that's typically a good time to buy Bitcoin. And then when it tends to spike, it means everyone's uh, cost basis is up and that's when people tend to take profits and sell. So both of these metrics, it, MVRV is recovering here, um, but it looks like we're still in a super healthy place and everything indicates that we're still pretty early in the cycle. But I think this dynamic you know, is still real. And when Bitcoin goes up enough, people will sell it to take profits. And anything that goes up as fast as Bitcoin is going up right now will go down again at some point. So can I make kind of, one point? Yeah. When we were talking about it's vol dampening, at some point it will be massively, you know, vol will spike. And generally, like think about um, NVIDIA shares, right? And if you, if, the float of NVIDIA is is held very tightly and the stock goes jumping higher. A lot of people don't want to take capital gains tax, right? And especially if it's held by passive, you you don't sell until there's outflows. Uh, active generally holds long term for, for decades sometimes. So I guess my my point is is that as the supply, we're already 75% of, of Bitcoin holders are not selling, they're hodlers. And as this new money gets in there, it chokes the float even further. And then you could have sort of like that, the, the gamma squeeze and volatility will spike massively. So like, I don't think we're at that stage just yet. Um, you know, even though it did pop, you know, in, to 65 shortly, like that was a tiny sniff at like, what could potentially come. But I think on the day-to-day, -day, it's it's not that volatile. If, if, if like 90% of the supply gets cornered, like think about what happened to San Francisco real estate. This is probably a better analog. Is like you had a supply dearth of housing in San Francisco and then interest rates dropped really low and it created that kind of like effect where all of a sudden houses were going for like, you know, 30, 40, 50% over. That's, this is sort of the same thing once the supply gets cornered, that the, the possibility is, and then you get, now that the options market is actually open, you get people buying like YOLO calls and creating those like massive gamma squeezes. So I just want to throw that out there too. I, yeah, to clarify too on this point of the volatility, uh, structurally long-term vol dampening, but we're at a point in the cycle cyclically that vol is expanding. And I actually... I'm a believer that like anywhere from two to 12 month vol on the asset is, is too cheap right now. I'm a buyer of that. I think if you, if you look at where we're at, again, it goes to the complacency. Um, I, I think that people are still not underestimating what happens when we get these daily inflows and the, and retail starts logging the Coinbase app, like we saw with that, that downtime this week. Um, it might look, different, right? We haven't seen a huge alt season and, and these types of signs that people are looking for, but I'm, yeah, I, you have a, you're rarely right when you talk like this, but I actually think that parabola is coming. I, I actually think it, it, it's co probably coming this month. I, I like, I look Ooh. at all the macro too. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I look at the macro indicators and this is coming from a guy that's been pretty hesitant over the last couple months on the macro side, I, um, it looks like the dollar's rolling over, gold's peaking its head back up. It looks like to me that rates aren't, aren't really going up that quickly. I think they do over the long term, but they look pretty tame. The yield curve's in, inverting, uh, more and, and not showing signs of stress. And then you look at NVIDIA and, and the NASDAQ and everything, it just keeps ripping. And, and to think that these flows are going to slow 
when the market's going to all time highs in equities is just, uh, it does, it just doesn't register with me. Um, so I, I, I actually think, I think it, yeah, it's, it, we're about to, about to go here. We'll I see. So but I think there's a muscle memory. There's a muscle memory as well with what happens when crypto breaks its new next, its previous all time high. I think a lot of people remember that. Um, but part of the reason why I think it's important to just urge a little bit of caution, this is around the point in time when people start to get drunk on green candles and say that the world is changing. And actually, so been doing this podcast since we started this in March of 2021. <laughs> Tyler, Tyler, you were there uh, for the first year of it. Okay. And honestly, if I went back and evaluated the sorts of takes you know, that the two of us had during that last period of green candles, I'm not sure how much of it really holds up. And it's very tempting to try to pull forward all this growth and excitement into like a year or two. But generally, like and all, all anyone's going to get, if you're listening to this podcast, most likely you're on Twitter or listening to similar podcasts like this and everyone is just like, you know, really rearing to go and excited. And I think that's a good a good thing to be. But I also think it's like, you know, don't totally lose your head either. Um, you know, mm-hmm. like, what, if, anyway, like my, my sort of framework is... Yeah. Like, it's like, you know, Stan Druckenmiller where like if... A lot can change very fast if there's a policy change or you know, the setup right now is great, but like if credit right. spreads, all of a sudden there's a credit event or you know, we could see tomorrow some you know, real estate developer causes some weird effect in the, the plumbing, like that changes the, the thesis. But for now, you know, credit spreads are pretty much at lows. There's massive inflows in, into credit. You know, they're probably terming out a lot of the high yield debt. If, if interest rates stay low, a lot of the commercial real estate guys can kind of kick the can. So there's there's a lot of things in the financial system that don't show any real stress right now. The equity vols yeah. like popping to new lows. I think the One best thing. example of like the path to Pennsy, sorry, just the last thing on that is, yeah. uh, you know, every everybody's year 2023 and year end recap was like, oh no, you know, every, how was everybody so wrong on recession going into the year? Everybody's recession call fell flat on its face. Well, actually, no. Uh, if we didn't get massive fiscal monetary stim- stimulus in March of 23 to solve all these huge banking issues <laughs> coming down the pipe, no, we, we were dead on deep recession. I mean, if there's no bailouts of these banks, we're major recession. So like, yes, yes, they were wrong at the end of the year, but it's path dependent. So what we're saying now about how macro looks looks primed you know momentum's building and and you know yeah that can change but like taking the facts at hand and and so you have to recognize how both of those can be true where yes at the end of the day everybody was wrong on recession but actually they were pretty right until about march 15th and then the bailout came there's there's another thing that like this is nuanced but Policymakers have figured out the software of monetary policy in, in the Treasury. Tip. Like Janet Yellen took it when the yield curve kind of goes back from when it's inverted to to a normal yield curve, curve that caused a little massive ramifications. And she started issuing debt on the front end of the yield curve instead of the back end to kind of keep everything copacetic. I think during an election year, uh, I'm not sure what the incentives were, but like. You know, if you back if you backload, you know, long duration supply and treasuries, like that, that can cause a lot of ramifications across all asset classes. So, you know, these are the things to pay attention to uh, going forward to change a thesis. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Mantra Chain, a security first, compliance focused L1 blockchain that paves the way for traditional financial institutions to onboard into Web three. Now, I've talked about Larry Fink on this podcast a bunch. You guys have heard the clips. You've seen him on CNBC. He's talking about his Bitcoin ETF first, then his ETH ETF, and then he loves tokenization. And what that means is he's looking at the trillions of dollars of real world assets out there, and he wants to digitize them and bring them on chain. And to do that, we need a compliant L1 that supports that. And that's exactly what Mantra is. So they're positioned as the blockchain for tokenized RWAs and regulated digital assets. They offer high performance, scalable architecture, and they support both permissionless and regulated compliant applications, which is a pretty cool feature. They're built on the Cosmos SDK. So they've got IBC Interop and they leverage Cosmwasm for smart contracts. And they've got a whole bunch of cool features like Guard Mobile, 
passportable DIDs, KYC and AML compliance, and the Mantra token surface. So this is relevant for devs. It's relevant for investors. Uh, definitely go check it out. Testnet phase two is launching soon, and that'll unlock a whole bunch of new opportunities and dApps. So click the link at the bottom of this episode. Again, I get no credit if you don't click the link. Uh, so that way, Mantra will know that I sent you. So click the link at the bottom of this episode and go check them out for yourself. Awesome. Do you guys think macro is in the driver's seat here for crypto, or is it starting to do its own thing? Like, I think, I think macro matters around these inflection points in crypto, but my mental model for this is that there's almost some sort of uh, critical mass buildup where that's, that's sort of where I think crypto is right now. You know, we've talked about this sort of magnet effect around all time highs where this muscle memory kicks in. And if you've been in this market for a little while, you kind of know what crypto does when it breaches its previous all time high. And then I think things that have mattered for the last 18 months, like, fiscal and monetary policy it kind of goes out the window and people are ready to roll the dice and get pretty risk on. Um, I, like, I, I'd just be curious how much you think about that. I think they're, I think they're intertwined, you know, as, as, as to, to a large extent, like for the same reasons that again, these, the, the NASDAQ's ripping, it's the same reasons crypto's ripping. So it sets the stage for the environment to allow this to happen and people to be risk on and, and, and see, you know, seeking this asset class out. Um, with the ETF, you have to be cognizant that like what we saw basically on those NASDAQ dips, like ETF continued the inflows. So you do have this new micro, uh, idiosyncratic dynamic there where this pent up demand coming into the asset, but that, that will slow down. Like it has to slow down at some point. And then I do think it becomes a little more intertwined and correlated with the macro again, where. Um, at the end of the day, I think it boils down to like real interest rates below 2% are, aren't that restrictive when, when governments yeah. are spending what they're spending. So we'll see if, if they do restrict more down the road, but so far. One thing, one thing is oil's kind of perking up here a little bit. And if there's, you know, any sort of oil shock that no one's been paying attention to it, to be honest, for a couple months now, that, that could cause some ramifications across a lot of the stuff too. What, what do you guys think would happen if inflation were to meaningfully pick back up from here? <laughs> I'm not saying that that's realistic, but it's sort of interesting to think through. To Bitcoin or to crypto in general? or Bitcoin large? and crypto, yeah. Honestly, I think it's now crossed the Rubicon of like an inflation hedge. I think if you had like a... A, a spike in inflation where the Fed really needed tighten monetary policy and you got some like deflationary forces, you know, in the interest rate, rate market, maybe Bitcoin sells off, especially that's what financial institutions pay attention to. That That's a possibility, but I don't know. I think it's, be, it's becoming a store of value. Like I think it's going to take the reins. That whole drop gold thing that Grayscale did years ago, I think now... Bitcoin is the new gold demographically. And my, my point before was like, China doesn't have any value anymore. In 10 years, like people are going to get gold passed down from their parents and be like, screw this, I'm buying Bitcoin. Like that's just going to happen. That's a fact. Like I don't think you're going back to like, like Gen Zers and the next generation who are so tech savvy being like, I'm going to hold this rock. Like in fact, here's another point that I made. Uh, there's all these Canadian brokers out there that like raise capital for little gold mining companies that are usually money laundering operations and fraud. <laughs> and, and like Bitcoins. Gold's fine. Like I'm not I'm not anti-gold. Like I get the premise, but I, it's just like technology is way different now and the world is changing. And but my point is that is so TradFi is providing capital for something that's like really hard to dig for in the ground. That's just a psychological thing. Meanwhile, like this whole other system is just gaining ground globally. And I just don't, it's so, so TradFi to be like an investment banker pitching a gold stock. It, whereas like this new financial system is so much more efficient in like 20 different ways. And I just I didn't see that unwinding at this point. I think it's just going to roll on itself. So maybe this is a point that doesn't really matter, but you know, this is maybe a little bit of the Jim Bianco point where do you think people are buying Bitcoin right now because they think it's a store of value or are they buying it because they view it as this hot money way to speculate? 
And I actually would argue, like, I think there's a nuanced point here where if you think, like, people in crypto, there's, <laughs> crypto looks like this very homogenous thing from the outside, but it's really, really heterogeneous, you know, if you work in this industry. And there are people who, like, really love the money angle, the monetary angle, and they focus on Bitcoin. And there are people who really love the tech angle, and they focus on things like Ethereum and Solana. And then there are sort of these, like, hot money gamble gamblers and speculators that put their money in things like meme coins. And I used to think of those two things as being very different trades, like meme coins versus Bitcoin. But it's kind of the same thing because the underlying driver of both of those things, why they're both going up, is this same effect, which is monetary debasement. Um, and over time, it probably makes more sense to keep your keep your assets in something that's a store of value. But usually, the meme like it's the same underlying effect that's driving the inflows into really speculative things and store of value things. And I think. What Jim Bianco's point is, which I would agree with for the time being, is I don't think most of the people that are buying Bitcoin today are in the mindset of, hey, I'm really worried long term about what the US dollar is doing and I want to hold Bitcoin for 50 years. I think TradFi is buying Bitcoin in the same way that crypto natives buy meme coins. I think what they're saying is there's this sort of hot money effect and they want to speculate. I don't think they're really buying this for the long term yet. I think they, but I think in certain regimes, I think it depends on the regime. I think Bitcoin is super unique because I look at it as 50% NASDAQ, 50% gold. And depending on the macro regime, it trades more like the other. So when ARK, you know, Kathy Woodstocks, Carvana and Beyond Meat are, are, are trending, the trad fight out the risk curve is, is it's two camps. It's, it's, yeah, let's reach for, for that beta. But when, Hamas attacks Israel in, in October and gold spikes and Bitcoin rallies. And so that's not a, that's not a, oh, I want tech stocks because there's war. Like that's a, I want gold because there's a store value. So I think it's highly dependent on the regime. Um, and, and Bitcoin can carry two properties and it does relate back to this inflation point. Does inflation rising matter? Inflation expectations are at their highest levels right now in, uh, you know, kind of up, bumping against that that peak since like 2022. I think the five year break yeah. even's at like two two point four. That and remember, higher inflation lowers real interest rates, which is really good for risk assets and stores of value. So if that's trending up slowly, in a way that doesn't make it headline news, where Biden and Yellen have to come and put the fire out, that's fantastic. Uh, for, for these store value assets, gold's peaking its head out. Oil's looking strong, but it's not derailing because it's not strong enough to go vertical and, and make the Fed have to walk back and hike. So I think that's this middle ground where you, this, uh, you can use the word Goldilocks, whatever you want to call it, where everybody knows we need some level of inflation that's above 2% to get out of this debt we're in. And it just can't be six. And if you're in that middle ground, these assets are doing really well. And that's where we're at right now. So I think I, I'm, I am a believer that inflation is, is at or has bottomed in, in that range. I, I think it's higher in six to 12 months. Um, maybe upwards of one to 2% higher, but it's not yet a problem for the bond market. I, I actually want to respond to that point. Uh, this was something I was going to ask you because we talked about is, is Bitcoin actually a good inflation hedge? And this is going to sound maybe a little bit like cope, but I actually think it functioned as a great inflation hedge last cycle because it ran up at exactly the time that you think it would run up as insurance, right? You're supposed to buy insurance before the house is on fire. You can't buy insurance once the house is already on fire. And I think I think if if Bitcoin is running up now, if you if you have that view of of inflation and, and real rates, um, then what it would maybe suggest is that we are headed back to a regime of inflation after this. And you know it was just 12 or 18 months ago where we were all really worried about inflation and watching every single CPI and PCE number come out. And, you know, the history of inflation in the two periods of time that we've had it in the US are the 40s and the 70s. And it is it has always been stop start inflation. And we're clearly watching a reheating economy here. You know, the stock market is going up, crypto's ripping. We're putting up GDP numbers that we haven't put up in decades. I mean, this feels like a hot economy. Um, well, so if you have GDP growth at five percent and 
inflation's at three and a half or four, the market probably still goes up, right? I think that's where if the Fed still tries to to tighten, I think the Fed's going to raise their target for inflation too, because you have demographics rolling over and the labor supply shrinking. So I, I think that's coming in the next couple of years. There's so many games that can be played just to keep this game going, right? They're going to change. They're going to, maybe they stop QT, you know, maybe they, the interest rate expense gets too high and they do some funky thing with the debt and extinguish it. There's, there's so many things that they can do to keep the software going. Right. It's always upgrading the, the, the monetary policy software. But I think inflation is, is for now until you see some geopolitical risk that, that like Ukraine war, which I think is now receding. If you look at um, Pippa, she's like, we're, we've been in war for years and years. And now all the global superpowers have been sapped. Like, I don't think they want to like finance this stuff anymore. Instead, I think that's why you're going to see like space become like a massive theme because it's going to be another cold. They'd rather fight economically than, than fight through, you know, because war is inherently inflationary, right? You yeah. take out of the, the labor supply to go fight and then you spend uneconomically. That makes me a little nervous though when people say that like we've evolved past hot kinetic wars and we're just going to want to fight economically. That sounds like a, a generation of people who haven't, but in these wars and like the whole and the whole of human history is punctuated by these conflicts like it would, it's an extreme minority to go 100 years and not have some sort of major conflict between superpowers i don't like have we bucked that trend what's the what's Maybe the reason why we like honestly COVID so, that. social media social media when you wake up in any country in the world and see like this huge uh that that dam in ukraine get just you know, crushed and like flooding hundreds of square miles and of and like, and you see these videos and these, these geopolitical stripes, like I, you can be the ba- worst human on the planet. And like, you're like, damn, that, that, that sucks. Like that's super messed up. And the atrocities of, of physical war. I mean, I, I don't like, I don't, I, I hear your point, Mike, because I actually think over a long, long time horizon, the same is true with the economy, where it, eventually if you band-aid, 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 it's a worse thing. It's like anything. If you don't fix a relationship, if you, like, you just duct tape it and it, it, it explodes or something down the line. Like, that's true. But funny. like, I don't know if you, <laughs> but I, I don't know if you need to like wipe out a population to, to start clean, right? Like we can get, we can do it, do it through an election and stuff. Like, yeah. I, I want to redirect us a little bit to talk uh, about markets. And I want to, there was a, a sort of polarizing take from Citroen Research, which is a pretty famous uh, short seller, where they talked about putting on this long Bitcoin short coin spread trade. And I think this gets to, this was one of the last points that Alex Thorne made in his thread about, is this market cycle of crypto going to play out like previous market cycles where just you know, stereotypically what you would think is happening is Bitcoin runs first. And then when people want to take profits, they actually rotate into sort of the next bucket of risk, which would be ETH, maybe the DeFi 1.0 sort of OGs. And then eventually once that runs, people rotate into the whatever the next bucket of risk is, alt L1s, NFTs, meme coins, whatever. And that's what usually marks the end of the cycle. Now, what Alex argues in his post is that the Bitcoin ETF money is a little bit stickier. Previously, these these types of purchases for spot Bitcoin were made on an exchange where you could very easily just rotate that into ETH or altcoins or whatever. Um, and maybe that effect isn't going to be the same uh, this cycle. And really what we're talking about here is, are these gains in Bitcoin going to bleed over into other things? I have pretty strong feelings about this. And I think you guys do too. Tyler, why don't, you, why don't you kick us off? What do you think? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in Alex's camp where I'm buzzing. I, I don't think, I, I think that that tectonic shift is like last time you had people buying crazy tokens. And I know you guys love Bonk and what was the other? I, don't, I don't love Bonk, but I don't Pudgies, love. Tyler, Pudgies. Yeah, Pudgies. Pudgies. I, I just don't, you're never going to get, you know, 
you might if there's a wealth effect that happens for a reason, none of this is financial advice i should have said that right at the outset here none of this is financial advice um but you're you're gonna get people playing these like uh frontier crypto things these crazy tokens if there's a wealth effect yes but it's going to be primarily retail driven you're never going to get it it would it takes these institutions 10 years. I'll tell, can I tell this small story? It's like when I was at Franklin Templeton in 2015, I was like, young guy, like, hey, we need to start a Bitcoin ETF at some town hall meeting. With Jenny, and Jenny Johnson was there and all these people at a big oak table just like laughed in my face. They were just like, you're an idiot. Like we can't invest in Bitcoin. And then fast forward, you know, they're doing now. But my point is they need markets to be big and liquid before they get in and then pump their product, they're not going to go transfer into uh, bonk and all these crazy tokens. Are you guys frozen? Oh, no, you just, no, we're just mesmerized we're by just your mid-term-ness. Yeah. <laughs> so, so like there, that's, that's just going to be a retail craze if it happens, but I, I just don't, I don't think you're going to get institutions playing that crap. That's fine. We don't need institutions. You're probably right. They're not buying Bonk, but but my take is it's delayed. Similar to the ETH BTC run that's been delayed because the Bitcoin ETF, for obvious reasons, we've just had tens of billions of flows come into Bitcoin thanks to this completely new avenue. Everyone's like going crazy because the rotation hasn't come and they're levering alts to the moon for trying to front run that, which could be fine, you know. Maybe, maybe the flows catch up to, to where the leverage is, but it's coming. Like whether that's the day of the ETF or likely when Bitcoin price is much higher because of the ETF, retail and everybody's going to come back in. And I think you can, if, if you have Tyler's view, that's fine. Go buy Coinbase because that's the alt where in the brokerage account where everybody who's holding, you know, tens of billions of new ETFs wants to rotate and, and explore else what's out there. And, and that's going to outperform. And I'm looking at gold up a percent, rates down over a percent, the NASDAQ up, and Coinbase is down today. Well, like, I mean, I'm going to go buy it after this. And, uh, and then the rotation two, no, it's not. And then, uh, and then two, the, the, the rotation two on chain alt is coming. It's just not as quick as everybody wants that transmission, but it's coming. Like, look at Doge, SHIB with Bonk in the last two weeks. Like, and this is the first, like sniff of retail just started coming. Like it's, it's, it's going to happen. Don't fade what's happened the four cycles in a row. I agree. I'm so completely in this camp, but I think this is the trap that people fall into. It's like, well, the institutions aren't going to buy pudgy penguins or, you know, Tao or whatever. You don't need them to. That's not who's buying it. The, the thing that people I think mistake as well is that Bitcoin's not a retail asset. Like people don't come in and buy Bitcoin anymore for their first time. Like just talk to people about it. Like they see the price of Bitcoin, like 57,000, 60,000, like no way, not for me. And the the point I, I loved Alex's piece and Alex, if you're listening, I'd love to get your perspective on this, but I've never really bought this idea about, oh, it's really easy for people to go from Bitcoin to alts because people were all on a crypto exchange back then. No, it wasn't. It's the UX of buying alts has been horrendous from day one, and it hasn't actually meaningfully improved that much. You have to do things like set up a wallet. You have to bridge onto these other weird chains. It's always been extremely painful, and people have still found a way to do it. But that's why these alts go up so much more, because you have all this liquidity in Bitcoin. You need so much more incremental money to come in to actually move the price, whereas these things people just view as beta. It's like a muscle memory type type thing. And yeah, I just think that the alts are going to absolutely explode. Let let me touch on just one point on this too, that I was tweeting about last night is the funding. And um, yes, funding is ridiculous. It's extremely elevated and trading on leverage. You're about to, you're, you're, you're picking up pennies in front of a a steamroller. Like there's going to be crazy wicks when leverage cascades and unwinds. However, go back cycle over cycle. When we, approach all-time highs and momentum is you know doing what it's doing funding doesn't reset to negative or zero percent and the reason for that is you have too much money wanting to get into the assets and not enough basically people that will take the other side and and like you said at the beginning mike eventually too high of funding like in the economy too high of interest rates 
slows down economic activity and causes that correction because the demand for that capital got so high that less and less things were, were economic. But we're still inflecting higher. And the key, this cycle to me, is the CME future. So you look yeah. at all these alts and things on offshore exchanges, funding's extremely high, but there's a shortage of dollars to ARB the CME, which is the most regulated exchange in the world. And that's maintaining 10 to 15, 20% funding rates, largely risk-free. You can do that now with the ETF and that's persisting. So funding on these alts is not going to come down as long as that exists. The, the dollars will, will first flow to the, the CME, then they'll flow into stable coins in these exchanges. And, and you probably don't get these huge, you will get flushes, but it won't reset funding. There's just a shortage of dollars. And so I think that he, has huge ramifications um, for the alt complex. Like you, I think you want to be, you know, pretty choosy with the ones you're investing in, but but you can't just say, oh, funding's too high. I'm not participating because it's going to be high for the rest of the cycle. That's just, just how it works until, until stablecoin and dollar supply back into the ecosystem, you know, multiplies from here. The, the funding's just going to be too high. No one wants to short that future. They'd rather, you know, take the long side. I think that completely agree with that, Quinn. And even, even zooming out one level of complexity, I think I view these assets, especially the major L1s like Bitcoin, ETH, Solana as being basically commodities. Maybe they're commodity like monies or whatever, but over time, I think they're commodities. And, you know, when I listen to even people in TradFi talk about commodities, the thing that I feel like people always, it's always the same argument, right? You know, there's a limited supply of this commodity and you are going to have to come in at some point and buy my bag. And the I think the dynamic that people miss on this and, and why people, why the commodities never enter that super cycle that people always talk about is this desire to, people will seek alternatives once the price gets high enough. And that is just something that I think is, that's exist, that exists in Bitcoin as well. And why I've never really jibed with these sort of, the sort of Bitcoin maxi point of view, which we've created this new type of asset that has limited supply, yada, yada is, Technically, you've done that. Yes, there won't be more than 21 million Bitcoin, but people will look for alternatives once the price of Bitcoin gets high enough to express the same trade that people are buying Bitcoin for in the first place. Wait, what about if it's just the winner? Like the internet was the winner, mm. right? Yeah. So, like, I, I don't, I, what alternative? I, I don't know. I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. Like, show me a use case, and maybe I'll I'll agree with you. Like, I don't, I don't really know how these alt tokens work, and so maybe I, I just kind of stay away, to be honest. But like, it, it it seems like I think the Fed will raise interest rates if people are making money so easily in altcoins. They're going to be like, well, this is killing our labor supply because. They're all getting like asymmetrically wealthy, and then the cost of employment goes up for every corporation. So, like, I, even if it lasts, it's gonna it's gonna be a flash in the pan. I think you're way more likely to have like a GameStop scenario in Bitcoin than you know a crazy alt market this time around. Here, here's something though about Bit. You maybe this is getting a little bit too technical for this podcast, but you, there is a difference in between Bitcoin the asset and Bitcoin the protocol. Uh, that supports that asset. And maybe to say something a little bit unpopular is like the tech for Bitcoin hasn't improved in a long time. The asset for Bitcoin is gaining, like is starting to compete on in, just in terms of liquidity and mind share. And that's what the institutions are buying. It's winning from a brand standpoint, but the tech hasn't gotten an upgrade in a long time. And just as a mental model for how you can think about these things is think about them as distributed systems of just distributed computers, right? Like just picture in your mind's eye, like a thousand different computers all running the same software. Like people look at these alts as like, oh, this isn't real or it's some hot money speculation. Like the Bitcoin computers haven't gotten an upgrade in a long time. There are new sets of computers which are getting upgrades and their tech, a lot, honestly, a lot of the tech on some of these new distributed computer systems are better than the Bitcoin tech. And this isn't me, just me saying this. I was part of a debate yesterday with Munib uh, Ali, um, who's the, the founder of Stacks, he said the same thing as well. Now that's changing in Bitcoin. Uh, there's actually this sort of renaissance that's going on underneath the hood and you're getting things like the BitVM, Stacks is a really promising layer too. But 
to be honest, like, I think that's something that people miss from the outside because they look at Bitcoin as the only thing that's legitimate and it's the only thing that's really decentralized and that people are going to buy. That's just not how I view it. I mean, these things at their core are these like weird, it's this weird mashup of currency and like operating system almost. And the tech is being innovated on and there is, there is a risk, right? Like, I don't know if Bitcoin's ever going to get fully disrupted as the king, but yeah. They're just different. They're just different. They're just totally like... Bitcoin is gold and, and store value. Everything else is internet and tech. Like that's just how I think. Like they're just not even competing in this. Like because their industry is so small, they get grouped together. But like, yeah, like it, it, it's like it, in 2000, everything got looped as dot com and one was a pet, pet food delivery and another is Amazon and Apple. It's like, man, these businesses could not be more different. They just revolve around the same tech. But eventually that tax and everything. That's, that's how I think about it. I can see that. I just don't think there's a use case for thousands of these things yet. You know, I think it's way, the capital cycle came in way too hot and fast. And I, yeah, I get they're all on being stopped. I get, yeah. like, I get, I get all these things, but there's maybe you need 20 of them. I don't know. But do you need the more, the more and more supply that comes of these like nonsense things, the worse, it, the worse it is. Uh, that's true. That's one of the things that causes downturns. The supply meets the demand for like, you know, it's like, right. There's always, but, there's always a supply response to all these commodity booms. But I'm going to push you on that because I, I don't think a lot of the, a lot of these things are going to fail just like most startups fail. That's what these things are. Yeah, they're just startups. Sure. And they're a lot like, of them are going to fail. Yeah, startups. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that they're nonsense. They're not nonsense. And actually a lot of them are going to successfully compete. And I actually, so I used to think that Bitcoin was in a total league of its own. I actually think Bitcoin and Ethereum and Ether compete for the same market. Like they have a similar design. They could have, Ether could have gone down a different road. Like if you listen to how the Ethereum Foundation talks about Ether, like they have decided to compete on a very similar vector that Bitcoin does, which is extremely distributed at the base layer, uh, very limited sort of hardware and bandwidth requirements for their validators or in both systems and like there's this kind of scarce money type thing i think the ultrasound money meme in ethereum was pretty bad and i think that's failed but the architecture of bitcoin and ethereum are very similar then you do have next gen blockchains which are competing on a different they have a very different approach actually there's kind of this solana celestia thing which is a different model that may end up competing can you teach me on this like my dumb macro view of this whole thing is what they're trying to create is really just a financial system, a new financial system that you can get interest from, from a capital, like your capital is more secure than it is where you have politicians just devaluing it. Right. That's all this is to me. It, and it's a new system. And I get you need different protocols to do different things on that system, but I don't, I, I, can I, can I give you a, this is how I think about all yeah. of crypto summed up. Yeah. Crypto is the creation of a new commodity, which is called block space. Previously, the relationship between hardware and software is that software was subordinate to hardware. Like I made my computer and then my computer sort of uses this software, but really like the control rests with Google that has its massive farm of uh, hardware. But what block space says is actually everything centers around the software, right? Can almost conceptualize like this network of computers that are all uh, coordinating around this and validating this sort of central software thing, which is storage in cyberspace. That's what block space really is. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of different designs um, for this system. And a lot of the big differences in these blockchains is what should the role of the computer be in these networks? And Bitcoin took this extremely opinionated approach where they said, I want anyone to be able to participate in this network. So I'm going to make the requirements for validating the network, becoming a, a Bitcoin node operator, extremely low, right? And the reason that they had to do that was because they conceptualized of the ledger that they were creating, this block space, as non-sovereign money. And the reason they had to make the requirements so low and permissionless to enter was because they knew that governments were going to crack down on it at some point, right? Now, that has led to an extremely distributed base of computers all over the world, which makes it very difficult to crack down on, very good for this store of money use case in the long term. However, 
there are lots of other use cases for distributed computing, right? Um, and you could make a decision to actually say, like the downside of Bitcoin's design is that the computers, because it's so easy to onboard, they can't do very much, right? They're not very powerful systems. And you can't embed things like business logic into these computers. That's why Bitcoin is extremely limited from a performance standpoint. So Ethereum was kind of like one step up from that, uh, which is there's you can build actually contracts, uh, smart contracts into the base layer. You can do some more things. But also, again, the hardware and bandwidth requirements for this distributed network of computers is extremely low. There's a new... The, basically, the way that blockchains are going is they're actually saying that it's okay to have larger uh, computers um, that can do more at the base layer. And the way that we're going to get around the centralizing effects of that is we're going to add new classes of computers. So there are things called full nodes. There are things called light nodes, um, where you can actually trade off some of the negative externalities of having large computers, which could be co-opted by states, essentially. And people are like this really like, if you go back and look at the block size, block size wars, um, you know, it's sort of been painted in retrospect as like there were good guys and bad guys and the good guys won. But that's not how I look at it. I think there were just two very different competing visions for how to build a blockchain. And basically, Bitcoin and Ethereum are on the small blocker side. But most of the blockchains that are getting built today, these next gens, they're more on the big blocker version of things. But they have found ways technologically to obviate some of the negative trade-offs that came with the big blocker side that just didn't exist back in 2017 when these wars were fought. That's how I would think about these things. And I, like, I have pretty strong conviction uh, in this future where there are realistically like five or six commodity like money things, L1s, that all compete with each other. I don't know what the power law looks like. Right now, the whole market cap of crypto is like 2.3, 2.4 trillion. 60% of that is a combination of Bitcoin and ETH. Does that relationship hold indefinitely into the future? I don't know. I would bet it doesn't. I think it actually gets more distributed than that. And it would actually be sort of poetic. I've heard, you know, I mean, Tyler, you know this better than me, but like how many, you know, there are hundreds of currencies in the world. How many actually have liquidity, right? It's like US dollar, right? The yen, the euro. 10 G20. Yeah, G10, G20. Really, there are like six or seven. Wouldn't it be poetic if in crypto, in this totally different system, you know, we sort of, wound up with the same market structure that we have with currencies in the room. I totally agree with everything you just said, by the way. I 100%. This is, that was a good tutorial. That, that was a great... My macro, that's... that's I love that. I, I'm, I'm not as technical, so that, that, that helps me. My macro simple, like, version of it is... In the, like, date back to the like, most basic economy. You have gold, which is the store of value, and you have oil, which is the initial like powers everything you you know kind of like the early form of like a dollar in in, a, in an economy um and you can look at bitcoin and eth ratio as the gold and oil ratio uh in and in if you assume that everybody is using these things in like 20 40 years from now everybody's you know got their store value and and their there is Bitcoin and Ethereum to, to do transaction activity that you have to pay gas costs. Um, in a, in a reset, in a booming economy, uh, you don't want to own gold. The, the asset used to pay for economic activity is in higher demand, supply shrinking quicker, gas prices are going up, demand interest rates for that capital is going up and it restricts the supply. Eventually, when activity gets so hot, ETH gas costs are untenable. That eventually leads to the demise. And, and then when there's a cyclic, you know, downturn cyclically, you'd rather own the gold, be, the, the Bitcoin, because now ETH supply is inflating more because activity is lower. So, so there's, there's less gas, less ETH being burned, inflation. But that's what naturally offsets a, a downturn economy. It makes transaction costs cheaper. Okay. Will will re-stimulate economic activity, and it's like this automatic monetary policy. So I think they're, I I think ETH is competing with the other ones like Sol and all this for for that infrastructure and like like base oil commodity type of thing. But as you point out, uh, a lot of them perform better, and that's why ETH's moving to these these roll ups and and higher throughput. That's how I view it. 
less technical, more like so it's a new so, so it's a new thing. Yeah, it's uh, it's this is I think crypto is sort of at the point in its development where analogy breaks down a little bit, and there are these. I listened to this this uh, there was a great invest like the best podcast a while ago about one of the early guys who got into Google, really successful public market investor. I think he. Uh, you know, he runs a big fund at Morgan Stanley or one of these banks. And he said there was a lot of intellectual horsepower dedicated to a pretty silly question in the early days of Google, which is, is Google a telecom company or like a publisher? And like ultimately, both of those were the wrong bucket for Google. Google was just this new thing. And all you had to do was actually look at the fundamentals of what Google was doing, the adoption that it was getting, the percentage of market share that it wasn't surrendering, the cash flows that it was starting to generate, and it was this new thing. And I really, I've really started to believe that, you know, there are these camps of, even within crypto, there are people who really don't care at all about the monetariness of it. Like there are whole swaths of people that are really just in it for the tech. And then in sort of the Bitcoin and increasingly the ETH world, where they're only really interested in the monetary aspect of things. And I think it has to be a combination of both of these things. This is a new online commodity money thing. And there's a monetary element of it, and there's a tech element of it. And those two things are related. And I just think it's a new category. Um, that's the beauty that's, of it. That's what makes markets. It's like, I'm yeah. not going to, well, maybe I would go, as you say, I'm not going to go work on the next NFT protocol, but if it's pudgies, I might. Uh, but like on financial services, I'm going to work on that stuff. Like, the next person's going to go work on building like the highest throughput blockchain with lowest transaction costs. The next person's going to build the the next bank on the, like, or a social media. Decent, like that's why it's so confusing for people outside the industry. It's like, how do you explain like, yeah, this is like just the base. It's the next internet, right? It's, 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 it can be anything to, to different people who, who are building and working on different parts of it, just using this technology. And that that's what makes it difficult to understand at times. All right, fellas. I think that's this is probably a good time to wind down. But uh, this was a really fun one. Um, and yeah, looking forward to. Can I get next. that sweater for next one? <laughs> you sure can. We'll do a jersey swap. <laughs> yeah, that would actually be good. What is Perch, Quinn? I was actually looking at that. Perch longer. is a, a buddy's uh, startup. Actually, they used to be GM.xyz, and they rebranded to Perch. And they're they're. I think of it as I like a, a good a, 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 AI driven. <laughs> I think so. a, AI driven Substack uh, with like speech to speech to audio. It recommends you know all these different kind of long form reading pieces. It's it's really interesting. You sh you guys should check it out. Did you get them to pay you to say that? No, but I I, it's, <laughs> I should now now I can start charging for it. Yeah, I I will say even as someone that was defending not defending but maybe being more accepting of this coming AI bubble, I gotta admit I'm not really looking forward to every protocol and every company and their mother rebranding to being AI powered. That is going to be like a little annoying. Not that purchase, not no, no, no shade on purchase, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I feel like that's, that'll be a thing in the next six months, but fellas, this was a really Gotta fun one. It. See you same time next week. Bye.